All right. Well, good morning to Thursday morning Bible study on Wednesday morning. So you got a day ahead of time. You'll be that much, much farther ahead. Um, <laughs> so we will, are continuing with um, the catechism. And you may remember last week we spoke mostly about the meaning of the Christ uh, and the Christ being the anointed one and uh, the father who does the anointing, the son who receives the anointing and the Holy Spirit who is the anointing, uh, which was, I thought, a nice right. way of kind of uniting it all to the Trinity. Um, so, so were there any questions about the Christ or do we want to go on to the only son of God? Okay, there's something else we were sort of discussing, but I forgot. I, I swear there was something. I swear there was something else we were supposed to be discussing. I must have forgot. And I said, we'll have to come back next week and talk about that. And maybe it wasn't a time before this and I just forgot about it. But it just no, hit me just I, now. I, I, I just remember something as well, but I unfortunately can't tell you what it was. Maybe it'll come to us as we. I guess maybe we're supposed to go through, uh, go past it <laughs> and discuss it at a different time. So, All right. okay. All right. So let's Here we go on from the Christ to the only Son of God. So, who would like to read? I'll read it. Okay. The only Son of God. In the Old Testament, Son of God is a title given to the angels, the chosen people, the children of Israel, and their kings. It signifies an adoptive sonship that establishes a relationship of particular intimacy between God and his creature. When the promised Messiah King is called Son of God, it does not necessarily imply that he was more than human. According to the literal meaning of these texts, those who call Jesus Son of God as the Messiah of Israel perhaps meant nothing more than this. Such is not the case for Simon Peter when he confesses Jesus as the Christ the son of the living God. For Jesus responds solemnly, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Similarly, Paul will write regarding his conversion on the road to Damascus, when he who had set me apart before I was born and had called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. And in the synagogues immediately, Paul proclaimed Jesus saying, he is the son of God. From the beginning, this acknowledgement of Christ's divine sonship will be the center of the apostolic faith, first pro professed by Peter as the church's foundation. Peter could recognize the transcendent character of the Messiah's divine sonship because Jesus had clearly allowed it to be so understood. To his accuser's question before the Sanhedrin, are you the son of God then? Jesus answered, you say that I am. Well, before this, Jesus referred to himself as the son who knows the father as distinct from the servants God had earlier sent his people. He is superior even to the angels. He distinguished his sonship from that of his disciples by never saying, Our Father, except to command them. You then pray like this, Our Father. And he emphasized this distinction saying, My Father and your Father. The Gospels report that at two solemn moments, the baptism and the transfiguration of Christ, the voice of the Father designates Jesus, his beloved Son. Jesus calls himself the only Son of God, and by this title, 
affirms his eternal pre-existence. He asks for faith in the name of the only Son of God. In the centurion's explanation before the crucified Christ, truly, this man was the Son of God. That Christian confession is already heard. Only in the Paschal mystery can the believer give the title Son of God its full meaning. After his resurrection, Jesus' divine sonship becomes manifest in the power of his glorified humanity. He was designated Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. The apostles can confess, we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. All right. <clears throat> All right. So this, so we move from calling Jesus the Christ to moving to call Jesus the only Son of God. Any original thoughts? Any you know initial thoughts before we kind of dive a little deeper? Nobody has any thoughts uh, about Jesus as the Son of God. Yeah, because I was, um, I didn't think about the fact that in the Old Testament that the title, the Son of God, was given. I didn't even think about that until I read it here. <clears throat> the angels and to the chosen people, in my mind, the Son of God was always the only Son of God. So I, I reflected on that. Uh, a little bit. Okay, good. Yeah, that's a, that's a significant point that the, this section is tries to uh, point out. And we'll, we'll dive a little deeper into that. Um, any other initial thoughts about this section? Mm. Okay, well, I'm sorry, wait a minute. Oops, are you there? Oh, I'm sorry. I had to put you on pause for a second. Where did he stop? Where did he stop reading? We went down. We did yes. the whole section called Son of God, and we stopped at before Lord. 440, 445 is where I stopped. Oh, okay. All right. So well, I stopped. I, another um, thought that I had or where I stopped and gave pause to was at the word transfiguration. Uh, around the corner from me, I used to actually walk one block to church, um, and that was St. Peter's. It was a Catholic church. And then um, Carter Memorial has it now because they tore down Carter Memorial, University of Maryland, and they bought the St. Peter's. And so Carter Memorial moved into that. And so the three churches now, St. Peter's, and another two Catholic churches are now called Transfiguration. So it made me stop and think, why did they call it Transfiguration? Um, with all the meetings in their head and all the voting, I never knew why they called it that. But then, it, then I just went back and did a little more reading. I mean, I remember the Transfiguration as far as um, when Jesus took Peter and James and John um, up to the high mountains, but then that word itself made me go back and think about how powerful transfiguration is. Not because it's the name of a church, but just how powerful it is. And it just made you think of... Um, the divine revelation of, of Jesus as the son of God. So I got stuck on that word for us. <laughs> okay, yep. So we see. Huh? I said we see. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let's we'll we'll work in in terms of how does the baptism and the transfiguration of Christ fit into all of this. So uh, this is, 
actually most i would say even most christians don't realize what this section teaches which is that the son of god just those three words depending on the context of how it's used does not always mean sort of the divine son of God. You know, so most of us probably when we hear the son of God, we think of the second person of the Trinity, right? The son, you have the father, yeah. the son, and the Holy Spirit. So therefore the title son of God must be a reference to the second person of the Trinity. <clears throat> and while that certainly can be the case, it's not necessarily the case. Um, and so that what this section is telling us is that when we see that term, son of God, we might have to do a little bit more digging and looking at the context to see who the speaker is and what the speaker might mean by that. Okay. Um, so it starts by saying, just as um, Loretta, you just pointed out, right, that, that the Son of God, the, the terminology originates in the Old Testament. Um, and it gets attached to the idea of a Messiah, King, uh, but it isn't simply limited to that. So the Son of God to call someone a son of God would be more in the Old Testament, a way of saying that there was a particular closeness or an intimacy of that person and God. Um, you know, there are places where God himself through the prophet says, you know, he will be my son, right? He talks about a Messiah and he says, he will be my son. Um, or he talks about King David and he calls him his son. Um, so in that Old Testament context, the title son of God didn't necessarily refer to a divine being. It didn't refer to the second person of the Trinity. It was more an, a reference to someone's closeness to God, that, that someone was particularly close to God and therefore was known as a son of God. Um, everybody kind of I mean, you saw, get that or grasp that or like, about that? So is that sort of like the Pope? You might say he's the son of God because he might have a closeness to God or something? Um, they, Instead they of could have. I mean, we don't use the terminology is, today because now, today, when we say Son of God, we're referring only to Jesus. <laughs> um, but, but yes. yes, I mean, you know, comparably, you know, you might call a Pope a Son of God because presumably there's a specially close relationship between God and the Pope. Um, but that's the point. By calling this, the Pope the Son of God, or by calling King David the Son of God, it was not to say that that person was divine. It was just to say they have a closeness to God. Right. Could you say it was more of a cultural thing? Because in the, in the very first sentence, title given to the chosen people, the children of Israel. So it could have been more of a cultural thing during that period of time. Yeah, it would have been, yeah, how they would have understood a close relationship with God. Right. Um, so, Speed automatic transmission, all wheel drive, plus cargo metal. Okay. Alloy, brake metal. All right, we got a mute queen there. It's um, the so, so the idea is what you're going to see in this passage is that the term son of God evolves until it gets to the point now where when we say son of God, we do mean the second person of the Trinity. 
but it didn't start that way. So it starts as expressing a close relationship with God, and then it becomes associated with the Messiah of God, right? The anointed one of God. Um, and so what this section is saying, when, when we read even in the New Testament, a reference to Jesus as the son of God, we can't always know what, what the person who used that title meant. Okay, so, so just because they might call him the son of God doesn't mean that they meant he was the divine son of God, the second person of the Trinity. Okay, and then it goes and gives different examples of where we do feel that he, that the reference son of God is to the divine person. And the first one they give to you is Simon Peter. When Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Mm -hmm. And the reason we believe that there's a deeper meaning to that is that when Jesus responds, that mere flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but only my father in heaven, which means if the father revealed to Simon Peter that Jesus was the son of the living God, then chances are that's a reference to the divine son of the living God. So you see, you see kind of how they start developing this idea yes yeah yeah that makes sense because i never made that distinction before so now it's going to kind of play into my reading and interpretation right so in fact when you go into this next paragraph 443 um when, for example, the accusers of the Sanhedrin ask him if he is the son of God, it's not clear what they mean, right, <laughs> by asking him that question. Right. Um, but we know by then, when Jesus talks about the son and the father, and he's my father in heaven, you know, that Jesus knows that he is the divine son of God. And maybe that's why he responds to them saying, you say that I am, because saying you don't really know what you're talking about. You know, so yeah, you, you call me the son of God, but you don't even really know what that means. So you kind of see that then, mm -hmm. then you have these two moments in Jesus's life, one at the baptism and one at the transfiguration of Christ, where we hear the voice of God say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we have to assume then at that point, God certainly means this is my beloved divine son of God, second person of the Trinity in whom I well please, because certainly God knows what he's talking about. So when God refers to Jesus as the son of God, God is referring to the divine son of God. And well, then, that must have confused everybody. <laughs> what's that? I mean, can you back? I said must have confused everybody when they heard uh, a voice that said that, did I hear a voice? It's like us sitting in a room and we all heard, this is the my beloved son who I'm well pleased. And all of us, we going, did you hear that? Uh, are you sure you heard that? They must have had a big, deep, deep conversation because it happened twice with different people and they heard this and I'm sure they had a deep conversation about this. Uh, yeah, and, and everybody... Actually, if you look real closely, it's interesting. In the Gospel of Mark, I think it's Mark, 
um, the the voice says it to the to Jesus. So it's not clear that anybody else hears it other than Jesus. Whereas in the Gospel of Matthew, the voice speaks and everyone hears it. And and they comment. Right. Um something like thunder, so, I think. Right. Um so you know, you're right, Dee. I'm, I'm sure when they heard the term, they not necessarily understood fully what even God meant by that. But we know we know that God meant to call him the divine son of God. But we don't know that the people understood it that way. So do you see the parallel between the title son of god and title the christ the messiah that those terms both of them start off meaning one thing to the people and over time as they experience jesus that terminology starts to mean something else so the term the Christ or the Messiah, remember, could refer to anyone at first who was considered an anointed one of God. It could have been a priest, a prophet, or a king. Right? Then it began to be associated more with just the kingship. Then it begins to be associated with Jesus, who is greater than an earthly king. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's the same thing with the title Son of God. So the son of God starts off originally meaning somebody who is particularly close to God. Then it gets associated with the king, Messiah, being called the son of God. Then it eventually is understood as a reference to the second person of the Trinity, the divine son of God. Okay. Um, and that's driven home certainly after the resurrection. Um, the the disciples begin to understand Jesus in a different way. You see the divine sonship of of God of of Jesus in the resurrection. <clears throat> so then, after um, Christ's work, all of His work of redeeming us. As we come to that level of understanding about, well, it's not a, when I say understanding, to my level of understanding about what I've learned about his, his work on earth and then his death and his resurrection and ascension, then it's more, I'm closer to understanding the definition of what the true son of God really is. Yes, that that the that the idea of Christ, Messiah, Son of God, they are they're not fully revealed to us until the resurrection of Jesus, and then we begin to grasp it. Okay, the, to realize that these terms are much more than just a ref, a reference to a human being who has a special relationship with God. Um, now, could they at first say that there was a Trinity, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Ah, that might still be a little early, you know. So just because they might have begun to understood Jesus as divine doesn't necessarily they mean they had worked out the idea of the Trinity yet. Mm. Okay, so remember, this is all a process of of revelation no one at one moment suddenly understands everything it it's all based on a reflection of their experience of jesus and of his life death and resurrection that they begin to get insights as to what really is going on here okay I tell you, I give you the fly on the wall because they were having some deep, heavy conversation to put this whole book together, you know, to come up with these ideas and thoughts. I mean, it just rattles the mind. Well, and, 
and you know, to some extent, one of the reasons that the followers of Jesus start getting kicked out of the synagogues is when they started to understand Jesus as divine, it sounded like to the other Jews that you were now saying there are two gods. You know, there's God the Father and God the Son, and that violates the central principle of Judaism, which means, which is, there is only one God and there shall be no gods before him. And so when the followers of Jesus started working out this idea that Jesus himself was divine, for many Jews, that was too much. And you have to go. You can't stay in the synagogue if you're going to say Jesus was divine. So that's what I mean by this you know, it takes time for them to figure this out. Um, they Just because they thought Jesus was divine doesn't mean they had worked out the reality of the Trinity. Is that how some, some of that Gnostic, Gnosticism, is that that word, how that came into play? Well, Gnosticism was around, but, but it gets linked into this where some of the followers of Jesus kind of by adopting Gnosticism say you only a certain few people will ever get this. You know, we'll have access to this secret knowledge of who Jesus was and what God was doing. Um, and that's why it's ultimately condemned because we believe that in time, everyone can ex can understand what God is doing in Jesus Christ. Um, it's not reserved to a select few. Um, and that's where not Gnosticism kind of gets condemned by saying it's really a select few. But you see how it could work in there where I'm saying Jesus is the son of God and I mean he's divine. And somebody is saying to me, well, how could he be divine? Because there aren't two gods. And I would say, ah, but I have a yeah. secret understanding as to how Jesus is the son of God. But you obviously don't get it. You know, that's maybe how Gnosticism functioned to some extent. All right. But yeah, to that point. Okay. I don't know what side I would be on. I don't know what side. I think I would be on the side where Jews are because, you know, I'm believing my faith that's strong and I'm saying to them, it can't be, this can't be right because there's only one God. I can understand them saying that because it's that the whole experience. And then here comes this other group now telling us all about Jesus being the son of God and he's divine. That gives you pause, you know. It's like, wait a minute, something's wrong with those people. <laughs> they are crazy, right. and so it would take some convincing me to be able to understand what they are saying. That's why I say I like to be the fly on the wall because it this they had a hard job. I mean, we are just in here, we are just reading what they already have gone through. I mean, I know we're we try to get people to believe in Christ and come to the church, you know, we have nothing compared to these people and what they, they first had to figure it out for themselves, what they were talking about and what they believed in. And now they got to go convince somebody else what this is all about. That is hard. I mean, that is hard work. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, you've heard me say it before, you know, sometimes people would say, oh, wouldn't it have been wonderful to have walked with Jesus and then the early disciples and, you know, be that close. And my response is, well, you probably right. wouldn't have understood what was going on if you were there. Uh, you know, we know who Jesus is and what Jesus did for us because we've had 2000 years just to reflect right. and pray about this stuff and work it out. And now it's just handed to us in this catechism. Um, but right. they didn't have the advantage of the, you know, the benefit of that. They were the ones that were trying to work it out. And 
So another right. principle, I think, uh, Dee, that you brought out nicely, and I always say this is really important because it has to do with respecting the Jews. Because there are many Christians who say, what's wrong with those Jews that they didn't get this, right? There must be something wrong with them. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with them in a sense, because these terms, which were Jewish terms, are being redefined on them. And, you know, they could be saying, well, you're cheating, right? You're changing the rules by saying that Christ now means this and that son of God now means that. Um, that's not how we understand those terms. And we're going to stick with the way those terms were handed on to us. And so we don't see Jesus as the Christ. We don't see him as the son of God. Because in order to see Jesus as the Christ and the Son of God, you actually have to redefine what the Christ means and what the Son of God means. Do you, you see that? Yes, it's sort of when you are, it's sort of like seniors today. We've been drenched in so many stuff for so long, and it's hard for us to make this change. They were, I mean, they have been these Jews for years and years and years. Centuries they've been Jewish, and centuries they've been taught this. And now here comes, I mean, they had to remember they had the prophets, and we all talked about that, and, you know, coming along and trying to help them discover who God is. And now we got the Son of God, y'all telling me, is coming now. And I, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my right mind around it, but it's not sinking in. It's sort of like us as a people, uh, we'll say black people. I'm going to use because I because I had this experience that once upon a time they were calling us Negroes, and then they saw we weren't Negro Negroes anymore. We were colored people, you know, and you know then we were African American people. And I remember, <laughs> I remember talking to my sister's mother in law, and she said she's a Negro. A colored woman. She's she's been that all her life, and now you're telling me I got to be African American. She does not. We she would not grasp that. Now we'll call African Americans. She could not grasp that, and I can understand. You know, she's almost 100 years old now. Anyway, she's still living. <laughs> but I'm telling you, she had a hard time trying to grasp this, and she just wouldn't. She didn't want him to talk about it. She didn't want to hear nothing about it. This is exactly what the Jews were probably going through. You know, uh, and, and Dee, what was her preference? Well, her, oh, she was going to be colored. She oh, okay. More colored. You know, she was a colored girl, the colored lady. She was going to be colored. And she wasn't going to change being colored, okay? So, <laughs> and, and that's the way some people are. But because they're hard to... It's sort of like the church. You know, the church decided, this church decided that the wording in the, uh, our creed wasn't good enough, so it gives us another creed. It needs, you know, they give us another creed to say, and uh, people are still, in fact, I get caught up myself saying some of the words that were in the old creed sometimes. And I go, oh, we don't say that no more. Right. And so sometimes people don't understand because the understanding that they're given don't make sense. The understanding that was yeah. given to them about this change, about our creed, don't make sense. Because it wasn't clear enough or wasn't said enough for it to be clear. Oh, yes, we've changed the way we say things, the way we pray, but it still didn't make sense what was wrong with the old way. This is why, Dee, I agree with you, and I, I think this is why people they want to rely on what they already know or what they've come to believe is because they were involved in the experience. Right. And I think that maybe instead of um, believing in stories that were devised by others, if more people had the their own eyewitness experience 
like Peter did. He didn't come up with stories about Jesus. He's telling stories based on his own experience. If I had experiences, then they are my experiences. And, and I can come to believe the story or I could do a better job of believing it because of my experiences. I'm a concrete person. So I truly believe based on my experiences that I've had in life and raising my family, what God has done for me. That's the experience that I have. That's the experience that I can share. And so I, I, that's the way I kind of look at it because there are uh, stories that people do devise that they, they want you to believe. So you have to come to a belief and level of understanding for yourself and internalize it. So I, I guess that's the way people work in the world. I don't know. Absolutely. No, that's right on, right on point, Loretta, that, uh, you know, and that distinguishes, you know, even people of faith. There, there are many people of faith who profess Jesus as, you know, the son of God, the Christ, but they don't have a personal relationship with them, right? I mean, they don't, they haven't really experienced it. They just are accepting it intellectually because that's what they taught, they were taught and they, they, you know, accept it. And, but there's difference then with people who've actually experienced God and the Christ that come at it, then they, uh, they, they, they understand it differently when they start using these terms. And, and I, I, that's, I, I think D the analogies you used with, you know, titles for, for um, African-Americans, black, colored, Negro. I, it's, it's, it's a good analogy that, you know, there's, it's not when people have a hard time grasping something new, it's not that there's something wrong with them. It, it's just that they're not making the same step that others are making. Um, and, and that's why I'm very big when I, I mean, because it's amazing in conversations that I'll have and people will really say, what is wrong with the Jews that they don't understand that Jesus is the son of God? Hmm. Um, and, you know, I would say there's nothing wrong with the Jews. It's just that it's not part of their experience. They, you know, they haven't had the same experiences as many of us have. And so they see the world differently. And it's, you know, it, we might say they're not seeing the fullness of what God is revealing uh, to us, but it's not like they're wrong. It's just that that's where they are. Um, and that was, that's my last point, and then we'll go on to the Lord. That, well, I that is, that's that I, I, Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I don't know if somebody's talking. No, I just wanted to say I'm listening to all of the comments, and they have been so powerful. We talk about discernment, but I realize through these conversations, I have to be even more discerning in reading scripture and especially going back to Hebrew scripture and not be judgmental. Because Father Rich, you are absolutely right. People, well, they couldn't they see this? And it was right there in front of them. But it's so much deeper than that. So much more, uh, you know, it's a progression. It's an evolution. It's a, a revolution through history and time and changes and what the Jewish people already knew and what was happening. And it happens to us. We we go through it like, like now we're going through a type of transformation. So we just have to be more discerning, non-judgmental, and, and just look at the scriptures in a way that helps us open our minds and, and not be like nitpicky about certain words and things and people in places, because like you said, Loretta, that wasn't our experience. Now we're reading about it. And I also think that we can judge people by their deeds rather than what they believe. Yes. I know, you know, I know people who say they believe that Jesus is the son of God, 
but their deeds show me the opposite uh, right. of what they believe. Right. So I, I just think that um, our deeds say a whole lot more about us than what we can come out our mouth and say what we believe. Yeah. And actually, that's what I, to bring that to kind of a conclusion is, is not only about judging people based on what they believe, but also not limiting the power of God, that God can work through more people than just Christians. And, and so, you know, that's why, you know, in our modern theology, we as Catholics, not all Christians will say this, but we as Catholics say that the covenant that God made with the Jews is still a living covenant because God doesn't break his promises. And so the Jews are living in a covenantal relationship with God. Okay. But as Christians, we begin to see how that covenant has transformed, not that it was broken, but it transformed into something else based on our experience of Jesus Christ. So that God is capable of being in relationship with us and God is capable of being in relationship with the Jews. And when we begin to you know, uh, cast the Jews off as there's something wrong with them, we're actually denying God's ability to be in relationship with them and to work through them. And when in fact, it's we're the ones that have the closed mind. Um, God can work through more than just Christians. And I say, hopefully God can work through most than just Christians because a lot of Christians aren't doing what God needs us, needs them to do. Um, so, so anyway, so what I want to do now is let's move to Lord and see if you can't see the same idea of the transformation of this title and as it applies to Jesus. Okay. Um, and, and then we'll kind of bring this whole section to a close. So, Michael, you want to continue to read? Sure. Uh, Lord, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the ineffable Hebrew name Yahweh, by which God revealed himself to Moses, is rendered as Kyrios, Lord. From then on, Lord becomes the more, becomes the more usual name by which to indicate the divinity of Israel's God. The New Testament uses this full sense of the title Lord, both for the Father and what is new for Jesus, who is thereby recognized as God himself. Jesus ascribes this title to himself in a veiled way when he disputes with the Pharisees about the meaning of Psalm 110 but also in an explicit way when he addresses his apostles. Throughout his public life, he demonstrated his divine sovereignty by works of power over nature, illness, illnesses, demons, death, and sin. Very often in the Gospels, people address Jesus as Lord. This title testifies to the respect and trust of those who approach him for help and healing. At the prompting of the Holy Spirit, Lord expresses the recognition of the divine mystery of Jesus. In the encounter with the risen Jesus, this title becomes adoration, my Lord and my God. It thus takes on a connotation of love and affection that remains proper to the Christian tradition. It is the Lord. By attributing to Jesus the divine title Lord, the first confessions of the church's faith affirm from the beginning that power, honor, and glory due to, to God the Father are due also to Jesus because he was in the form of God. And the Father manifested the sovereignty of Jesus by raising him from the dead and exalting him into his glory. From the beginning of Christian history, the assertion of Christ's lordship over the world and over history has implicitly recognized that man should not submit his personal freedom 
in an absolute manner to any earthly power, but only to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Caesar is not the Lord. The church believes that the key, the center, and the purpose of the whole of man's history is to be found in its Lord and Master. Christian prayer is characterized by the title Lord, whether in the invitation to prayer, the Lord be with you, its conclusion through Christ our Lord, or the excla exclamation full of trust and hope, Maranatha, our Lord, come, or Marin, Marana, Maranatha, come Lord, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That sounds like a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, you see the difference between what they've done. Ma Maran Atha, mm -hmm. which means our Lord, come. Or mm -hmm. Marana. Marana, um, that's it. Come, come, Lord. So it's interesting that you can, depending on where you put the break, it, it will depend on how you translate that. And, you know, in the ancient world, in both Hebrew and Greek, they didn't put spaces between words. It was just a string of letters. So that's why sometimes they get a little confused as to, uh, so all those letters would just be put together, M-A-R-A, and, you know, but, so they're not sure, is it Marin Atha or is it Marana Tha? Um, but either way, it pretty much means the same thing. Come Lord Jesus. Um, so, all right, let's kind of go back a bit. So any thoughts about how the title Lord morphs? Well, oh, yeah, I was, yeah, I, it was sort of like the, the son, the Lord, Lord. They used Lord for everything. Everybody was a Lord. Uh, it was common for a Lord to be the, 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 be the one in power, be the one in power and the one that you look to to take care of you and yours. So you always said, this is, this belongs to the Lord, which is the Lord of the manor, the Lord of the house, the Lord of the land, it was the Lord. And so they, now they are transferred that word to me because it means power. They have, now it means something different when it's put on uh, attach to the name of Jesus. It has a, a power that means that it's for all time. Well, before it attaches to Jesus, who does it attach to? Demon. Uh, God. God, yeah. No, it's I'm glad you said that because I was a little surprised that this section didn't start as the others did with what the ordinary meaning of the title Lord is. Because I, I think sometimes people yeah. forget that. Lord was a title we gave to humans, just as Dee said, who were in power. Uh, so lords were the lord of the house, the, the, the person who was empowered. Um, or yep. um, lord was um, the, you know, and we call the, the feudal society, right? You had, you had the kings and then underneath you had the lords, right? And those were the ones who were in charge of the smaller uh, areas of land. Um, you may not know, but if the word kyrios, right? Which is the Greek word for Lord, sometimes gets translated mm -hmm. as sir, uh, you know, to because it's not referring to the lordship of God, it's just saying, "Sir." When when we say "Sir," we're um, we're sort of you know acknowledging or giving deference to the person that we're speaking to. Um, in Spanish, the the word "Señor," which means "Mister," well, it gets translated as "Mister." It also can get translated as "Sir." or it can also be translated as Lord. So Jesus in Spanish is referred to um, Jesucristo Señor or Señor Jesucristo, which is Lord Jesus Christ, not Sir Jesus Christ or Mr. Jesus Christ. 
So the first thing you have to realize is that the term Lord exists apart from anything to do with God. Okay. But it gets attached to God. Why does it get attached to God? Because he's all powerful. Yeah, well, and it, they, 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 they don't really do it. a good job of it here, but there's a, a, also a very real reason why they start calling God Lord. Because why they what it says, it? I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. No, I was going to say, was it when they indicated that it said it indicated the divinity of Israel's God, attributing that divinity? It, well, it, it actually works the other way around. Once they start, once they start talking to God as Lord, then that title Lord takes on, div, you know, d divine aspects of it. Okay. Whereas yeah. before Lord would have just been an ordinary title. The reason they do Lord is that remember they don't want to say the name of God because yeah. because that they felt would be disrespectful, right? Yeah. To actually say the name of God. So what they did was, and you know we've talked about this in the Bible, where the original text says Yahweh, instead of saying Yahweh, they would just put in Lord. Lord. because they didn't want to say Yahweh. Um, you know, it was forbidden back in the day to write out the word God anywhere. And I think John is the only one that broke that rule. <laughs> and Regina, it still is. Most Jewish people will write G-D. They don't write out God. God. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the whole idea of calling God Lord comes about because they don't want to call God by his name. They know what God's name is, but they're not going to pronounce it because, you know, in their worldview, to pronounce the name of God would be, you know, sort of try, making themselves equal to God. Oh, I know God so well. God and I are in such good terms, I can call him by his first name, right? Um, th that th they didn't want to imply that. So they don't use the name of God. They know the name of God. And if you read this text in Hebrew, it says Yahweh, but they don't, when they're reading it, they'll see that and they'll say Lord um, because they're not going to pronounce the name of God. So, so the idea is first, Lord is a human title. It just means somebody who had authority. Right? There's nothing necessarily divine about the word Lord. Okay, but then when the Jews started talking about God, rather than use his name, they, use, they start using that title Lord to refer to God, right? And now Lord begins to take on a divine meaning. So that when they start calling Jesus Lord, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to depend on the context. Are they calling him Lord because they see him as a human master, you know, a human person of authority? Or are they saying Lord because they see something about his divinity that they want to give him that title? Um, but in the end, there's no doubt that ultimately when they call Jesus the Lord, they mean he is God. He is taking on the same lordship, the same divinity that God himself has. Do you kind of get that? Right, right. And, and of course we yeah. know, we know that they made, they finally made the connection, whereas I'm trying to see where it is. When uh, Thomas said, oh, here it is. When Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Okay, that, that statement is the, <clears throat> what is it? The cold, you know, the coming together of calling Jesus Lord and calling him God. 
uh, so that mm -hmm. when we say Lord, we do attach a divinity to it. So when we say Jesus is Lord, we're not just saying Jesus is a powerful person with authority. We are saying Jesus has divinity within him. Just like how Christ became, you know, first an anointed one and then ultimately came to mean the divine Jesus. And just like Son of God started off as a close relationship to God to being divine itself. So do you see the parallelism that they've done here with those titles, Christ, Son of God, and Lord? Yes. Now, then this is how I want to conclude. We'll read the um, we'll read the summary right after this. Now, to me, the important thing to learn, if you can wrap your mind around this, is this is how revelation works. So it's not like Jesus at first was just close to God and then ultimately Jesus changed into the son of God, divine, right? Jesus was always the divine son of God. It's us who has to work that out. And it is through the spirit of God that we work it out. So God has revealed to us everything we need to know in the person of Jesus Christ but it takes us time to figure that out. And that's why we don't know about the Trinity until after our experience of Jesus. It's not that there wasn't a Trinity before Jesus. It's just that we hadn't yet, God hadn't yet revealed it to us in Jesus Christ. And once we had the experience of Jesus Christ, and we had some time to work it out, we began to understand more fully who God is. But it's not that God changed. We're the ones who changed. Good summary. That, that, that I just keep hearing two words, progression and understanding through this, through this whole thing. You know, even how the words progressed into something else based on the level of understanding so that that i'm hearing that in my head as well i'm hearing it we show a smoke in this stuff that's what i mean but, but but it gives more meaning again too father um for me that the scriptures like we talked about the gospel were written after the fact like john and whatever once the understanding came the writings came after the experiences were told over and over and over again. Right, and that experience then gets reflected into what they're writing. Yes. Um, so, and, and just to build on that, Michael, so, so for me, what I, I get, faith is a process, okay? It's not a one-time thing where you go from no faith to all faith. Faith is a process so that even as a people our faith developed as we were experiencing of you know as we were reflecting our on our experience of Jesus Christ as individuals our faith develops as we reflect on our own personal experience of Jesus Christ just like Loretta was saying so that we there is always room for us to grow in our faith. It's never over because there's always more that can be revealed to us. And, and that's why these things, you know, you, you all are unusual in the sense that you get that and that's why you do Bible study and you have these conversations because my sense is you feel your faith is affected by these reflections. Is that, that right? Pretty much. Yes. Yeah. So even though you've been a Christian your entire life, you're a different Christian today than you were 40 or, or 50 years ago. 
Um, and that's because faith is a process. It's mm -hmm. not a one-time thing. Amen. Wow. But, but uh, Michael said it earlier, I think Michael said it, it, uh, it the being the process that we had experienced stuff before we could understand it. I think he was saying something like that. We have to experience it. So our faith become part of our experience and then we can understand what all this stuff we heard is saying or we read is saying to us. Mm -hmm. and now we understand it because, because of our lived experiences. Exactly. Let's understand. And so we as older folks have a different faith experience, you know, a, a faith understanding than a 10 year old does. And it's not because we're smarter than 10 year olds. Who's smarter than a fifth grader, right? It's, it's because we have more experience in life that can connect to what God is revealing to us. And that's why, in my opinion, it's so important that adults do this very process, that adults continue to study and learn and reflect and pray about their faith. Because the fullness of our faith changes over time. And unfortunately, we have a lot of Christians out there, Catholic and Protestant, who are work, walking around with an eighth grade understanding of their faith because they stopped learning about God and Jesus when they were in grade school. And they carry that understanding with them for the rest of their lives, as opposed to really continuing to reflect on their life experience and reading the scripture and learning of what has been revealed to us and making our faith more relevant. So you are unusual. I hope you realize that by doing this. Wow. Well, going through this is, 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 it's really uh, bringing the word even more alive to me, you know? Sure. Yeah. And, you know, to I, you know I, where, where Dee yeah. said we got started, you know, that's why I do this. I don't do this so that you can go out and get a master's degree, right? <laughs> I, I do this with you because I know that the deeper I can get you into the faith, the richer your faith will be. That is so true, Father Rich. And, and, not, just, and not just reading. I, I really appreciate it, but then, then putting it on you know, living it, mm -hmm. you know. And you also that, have a, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's it's just like a more deliberate, deliberateness, you right. know. Hey, it's been revealed. Now go out and put that on and then live it, you know. And in this world, it's, it's tough. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, and I was going to say, reflecting back on, Martin Luther King's speech that I love what D played was as we get older and we have experiences and we mature, one of the things that he always talks about is how do we, you know, how do we respond to hate with love? That takes a lot of experience and understanding to be able to take that action. That is one of the toughest things I think us as older people can teach younger people. Father Rich was talking about the experiences of young children are, are much less than ours. It takes work to um, convince them something like, how do you respond to hate with love? It takes a lot of work to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just, um, I just want to thank you, Father Rich, for just taking us on this Christian journey because it really has um, contributed to a change in my lifestyle with some things. So, and I prayerfully that I can convey uh, many of what I learned in this in these lessons uh, to others, and I see myself doing that more and more as I meet strangers 
-hmm. So I'm, I'm thankful for that and I'm at peace with that. So thank you. Great. Well, I, I love doing it and that's why I get paid the big bucks, right? To do it. Um, <laughs> Well, wait a minute. I, I mean, that also, I mean, just to kind of finish that off and then we'll, we'll look at the input. You got that from Father Miller, didn't you? You get paid the big bucks. But, but I was going, I was actually going to do that. I mean, so you have to understand for me personally, knowledge is my entry into, you know, into God. Uh, you know, I, I tend to, enter into God much more through my intellect, you know, by processing things there and then getting my experience from my intellect, as opposed to someone like Father Miller, who, um, you know, not that he didn't do things with his intellect, but Father Miller tended to be more about the emotive side of us, right? Emotion. Uh, and, and that gets reflected in our difference in preaching, right? So, you know, Father Miller, we now call him, he's the preacher, because when Father Miller preached, he gave you an emotional experience of what he was trying to teach you, right? Um, and, and, and that's how, you know, he could get you all revved up, right? Because that was the whole idea of giving you an emotional encounter with God. Whereas I'm much more, as people say, I'm not so much the preacher as I am the teacher. And, and my technique is more to try to give you an understanding, you know, an intellectual understanding so that you can go and think about that as opposed to, you know, it, you know uh, draw through your emotions. Both are absolutely legitimate ways of bringing people into experience of God. It's just different. And, you know, that's, that's why I love doing this. I am a teacher. I, I, love to, I love to learn. And so I love to have other people learn because I believe it will make a difference in your life. The more you learn, the, the more different you'll be. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to kind of make that a little personal that way. All right, Michael, why don't you just read the summary and, and that'll bring this section to a close. All righty. In brief, the name Jesus means God saves. The child born of the Virgin Mary is called Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The title Christ means anointed one, Messiah. Jesus is the Christ, for God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He was the one who is to come, the object of the hope of Israel. The title Son of God signifies the unique and eternal relationship of Jesus Christ to God, his Father. He is the only Son of the Father. He is God himself. To be a Christian, one must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The title Lord indicates divine sovereignty. To confess or invoke Jesus as Lord is to believe in his divinity. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You Amen. took it right out of my mouth. That, that, <laughs> I'm going to stop the recording right there because that's just, you couldn't get a better summary of that. I and, know. Uh, and we'll talk about getting together next time. <laughs>